And uh, so I like to, to do things in a particular way. And the first step, of course, is we're going to define terms. Right? Because mythology gets a bad rap in our culture, and uh, particularly uh, in our post-enlightenment, modern scientific world. We think that myth means one thing in general. Right? We say things like, oh, that's just a myth. And that means something that's untrue. And so if you're on the, uh, there's two sides of the note. One of them has uh, dates at the top that tell us kind of what the overviews of the four weeks are going to be. And we've got two parts of defining mythology of the uh, mythos, which is a Greek word. And it means story in general. And I've got some a little more detail there, a report or a tale. And really, we're looking at mythos as a pattern of beliefs expressing, often symbolically, the characteristic of prevalent attitudes in a group or culture. Notice that it doesn't say something that's not true, but people believe to explain stuff like the sun and the moon and the stars and lightning and rivers and seeds growing and stuff like that. That is not what mythology means. Right? When we say, oh, that's just a myth, that's what we often imply. Right? But that's not what mythology is. Mythology is much more than that. That is one thing that we often say, oh, it's something that's untrue, but we believe it anyway, or it's untrue, or it's not factual, and we hold this belief because it helps us explain other stuff in the world. But sometimes mythology is true, and we'll get more into that. The other word that we want to know when we're thinking about mythology is logos, and surely you've heard a sermon on John chapter 1 before, right? In the beginning was the logos, which is often translated word, and it does mean word, Right, that's one of the translations to have a single word-for-word -word idea there. But it also means idea or wisdom. In the ancient cultures, particularly the ancient Greece, logos meant the rational idea that found the universe, the logic that holds the world together. So when, when uh, John says that in the beginning was the logos, he's not saying in the beginning was a single spoken word. Right? He's saying, in the beginning, there was an idea of the universe that encompassed everything and made the universe to be. And when God speaks his word into the universe, or the chaos that was before, he's speaking his idea, his rationality. In all the ancient cultures, we see this idea of chaos, kampf, that's a German word, and kampf means struggle, in case you've never that, but there's this struggle between chaos and order. The word for our universe. Right? We often call it the cosmos. Cosmos doesn't mean the universe, literally. It means order. It is a contrast between chaos and cosmos. The, or the order, the cosmos, comes out of chaos. And in a lot of the ancient cultures, the idea of the creation of the universe was that the gods, or the god, fought against chaos and brought about cosmos. So we live in a post-enlightenment culture. We've had the scientific revolution, we have the scientific method, and ancient cultures did not. And a lot of times we have this definition, if you're on the notes, modernist bias against the supernatural. Myth is often defined in our culture as a necessary and universal form of expression within the early stage of man's intellectual development, in which unexplainable events were attributed to the direct intervention of the gods. That's what people often mean when we say, oh, something's a myth. My son, Curtis, he's and, all and one of his friends found out that he was a Christian, and he said, you know, it's 50% likely, or the odds are 50% that Jesus was just a man. Right? I love that you put odds and a number and said that Jesus was just a man. And I would say, odds are 100% that Jesus was a man. Not that he was a false myth that was necessary for me to understand the foundations of the world, but he's a myth, an idea, a story that helps us understand the reality of the universe. C.S. Lewis says, some myths are true. Right? I've got a whole bunch of people here that I like to talk about when I'm talking about what a myth is and understanding how we read mythology, how we read stories, how we read narratives. A lot of people have different words for myths, and one of them is Neil Postman, who's a great uh, communications professor from NYU, uh, the late Neil Postman. But he wrote, narratives give understanding and meaning to cultural persons. That's something that helps us understand who we are. Right? Communism is a narrative that helps people understand this. Right? Christianity is a narrative that helps us understand our meaning and purpose in the world. Christ, the story of, of Jesus, is a narrative that helps us understand who we are and where we're going. John Eldridge, I have a stack of books here. This is my nerd cred. Right here. Right? And 
I have a whole bunch of stuff here, but John Eldridge wrote this great book called Waking the Dead. And in this, he talks about how mythic stories help us to see clearly, which is to say, they help us see with the eyes of the heart, right? Jesus prays that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened, that we would know more about him and who he is, right? If we have seen Jesus, we've seen the Father. That's great stuff. Uh, Clyde Kilby, he was the president of Wheaton for a while. He says that myth is the name of a way of seeing or a way of knowing. How can we know the universe without seeing? Now, our modernist society would say we need to see by measuring, right? Science is the ultimate way to understand the world. Science is itself a type of mythology. It's a, it's a lens through which we view things. And I think that that's not complete, right? There are lots of things that we cannot measure. We can't weigh them. We can't see them. We can't touch against them, right? We can feel the wind. It's true. We can measure that. But can you measure love? No, right? I can't weigh it. I, I can feel it maybe, but I can't. I can perceive it, but not in ways that are measurable in a strict scientific sense. And that doesn't mean that it's not true, right? And quarks didn't not exist until we were able to identify them and observe them, right? Electrons didn't not exist before we were able to see them through an electron microscope. They were always real. They were always there. We just didn't have ways of measuring them. So science is inadequate in those sorts of ways. I'm going to skip C.S. Lewis for now. And I'm going to go to the second Corinthians passage. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. This is some context for this. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. As Christians, our worldview, the lens through which we look, has to be that of Christ. We have to try and identify what things are of Christ. And in Romans, Paul says that God has made himself known to us. It is abundantly clear in creation. And that might mean in nature, the physical things we observe, but it also means the things that we see and feel and hear and know in our hearts. God has made himself known to us, revealed to us, and that we can capture our thoughts or capture those thoughts and make them obedient to Christ. And Jesus, he didn't tell the truth all the time either. Right? He always told the truth. But he didn't always tell the facts, right? He told parables, which weren't necessarily true stories. But they didn't need to be. You guys have seen that Indiana Jones movie where he's up in front of the classroom and he writes F-A-C-T. Archaeology is a search for fact. If you're looking for truth, you can go down to Professor So-and-so's class down the hall on philosophy. In our culture, we equate fact with truth. If something's not factual, it can't be true. Or if something is true, it must also be factual. We have this modernist interpretation of what we're looking at, and it's incomplete. I wouldn't say it's wrong, but it's incomplete. Jesus spoke in parables because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. In some ways, he's talking about exclusionary talk that people who refuse to see and refuse to hear won't understand. They won't know who he is or what he's come for. But he also is saying there are things that we need to understand with our hearts. We need to see with the eyes of our hearts to understand what's happening. Let me go to Tolkien here. The Gospels contain many marvels, particularly artistic, beautiful, and moving, mythical in their perfect self-contained significance. Tolkien's not saying that they're not true, right? He's saying that they have this idea of greatness. They have this sense of more than mere story. The Gospels have this. They have a mythical element to them. This story has entered into history and the primary world. This story is supreme, and it is true. I love this song. Art has been, has been verified. Right? This idea that we've long known in our culture, it has been verified, it is a fact that Jesus lived. Right? God is the Lord of angels and of men and, he says with a wink, and of elves. <laughs> Legend and history have met and fused. And I think that's actually in one of these down here, I have a great fairy tale that's an introduction by Tolkien about the idea of fairy tales and myths and legends these stories that sometimes we don't take at face value, and we probably shouldn't all the time. Right? We don't, I don't take Rapunzel at face value. Right? But I do take the idea of these stories. In I take them to heart. Right? I open up my heart to these ideas that what are the greater truths that we're looking at? 
Now, before we get all the way to week four, where we're talking about children of the high king, or even to modern mythology is right, like my awesome necktie here. It, it is a good thing, after all. Okay. I, I'm not saying that Superman is Jesus, but I'm definitely saying that Superman is Jesus in lots of ways. I was telling uh, Hank and uh, Hank Wilcox that these two Jewish guys wrote Superman right, because of their desire for Messiah. It's obvious, right? If we don't have Messiah, we need one. We need a hero, right? And the manifestation of Christ in the world for some people has to be something like this. This is what they're struggling for. They're reaching for the Superman who will save them and rescue them. And we'll talk about the parallels between Superman and Jesus <coughs> later. Today. But when we think about our world in terms of the way that our world wants us to think about it, in scientific, measurable senses, we miss out on a lot. When we try and talk about the scripture in the same way, we miss out on a lot. Now, this is the part where I get in trouble with some people. But when I read Genesis chapter 1, I'm not reading a science textbook. I'm not reading a direct account of the way that God, in his lab coat and safety glasses, built the experiment that is the cosmos. I'm reading a story a myth, a mythos myth, a story about how God made the world, about how Yahweh, Jehovah, the one true God, is in charge of everything and has put creation underneath his rule. That's what this story is. Now, the creation story, if you've read a lot about you, if you have probably heard that there are two sort of versions of creation, right? I'm not sure if they're split right in chapter 1 and chapter 2, but they're somewhere in there. Glenn will know. Right. Chapter 2, verse 4, there's a split, and there's a retelling. It, it starts again. Right. So if I'm going to read that in a strict scientific sense, it means that God started his recipe and was about to put it in the oven, a la the Far Side cartoon, right? And then he decides that it is indeed half-baked, and he starts over. <laughs> right. But that's not how it works. It's told, and then it's told again in a different way. In the ancient Near East, there were a lot of creation stories. A lot. Of them. And we have uh, we have these texts from the ancient times. They're on clay tablets and they're written in cuneiform or some similar thing that I might have the word wrong for. But they talk about the idea of where the universe came from, right? This is cosmology, right? Where where did the universe come from? Cosmogenesis. And if we're going to read these ancient Near, ancient Near East creation stories, we have to read them with the eyes of the audience in mind. They weren't scientifically minded. That doesn't mean that they were in an early stage of man's intellectual development. They just they were pre-scientific, and that's okay. To read the creation story with a scientific viewpoint is to do it injustice. Some authors call it violence against the text. Right? They were trying to interpret it in a particular way. But there's this great group, uh, I'm not sure everybody who was involved in this, but in Chicago in 1978, there was this group that got together, and the initials are ICBI or ICID or something like that. But the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy, and it talks about what we mean when we say inerrant. Because People out in the world, when I say the Bible is inerrant, they say, so you believe in a literal six-day creation, and you believe that, who's that guy with the ark? Noah, right? That he had all of those animals on there? Because I can tell you, all the population of all the world's animals, even if you only had two, not, not to mention the seven, you also had to have other kind, they couldn't possibly fit on an ark of that size, right? They freak out when I say, I believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. But inerrancy doesn't mean that every little fact is exactly right as we could measure it and scientifically analyze it. Here's a little statement at the bottom of that first page. Differences between literary conventions in Bible times and in ours must also be observed. Scripture is inerrant, not in the sense of being absolutely precise by modern standards, but in the sense of making good its claims and achieving that measure of focused truth at which its authors aim. When I tell my kids, where your babies come from, right? Well, the babies in the mom's tummy. Is that a lie? No. It's true to a degree that my audience is capable of understanding or to which it's appropriate to share. 
right? It's, it's not a lie. Now, if I said they come from the sword, that might be a lie. But in a sense, right, this metaphorical being, this mystical sword, is also true, in a sense, right, from a certain point of view. Please, please, please don't, you know, get out of your pitchforks and torches and drag me out of the room when I say this. <laughs> but the Bible is not always accurate in a scientific, measurable sense. And it doesn't have to be for it to still be true. Okay? And when we look at the creation story, we're looking at a tale of subversion, of adoption and hijacking in some senses. In the late 1800s, there was a guy named Herman Gunkel, and he wrote about this creation and chaos motif in the ancient Near East. The Mesopotamians had a culture where their view of the cosmogenesis, the origin of the universe, was that the supreme god, Marduk, had a fight with the god of the sea and the rivers, Tiamat, and after defeating the sea, this chaos god, that is when the world comes into being. Right? That that is the power of the god, Marduk. In 1928, there's an archaeological discovery where they find these other tablets from an older time. And it turns out that the discovery, the, 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 uh, <coughs> the Babylonian god, Marduk, was actually a god who uh, was renamed. The original name was Baal, B-A-A-L. Right? We see this time and time again, right? where there's like the Greeks and the Romans who actually stole all the notes from the Celts, but that's a different story. They rename them, right? and they say, these are the gods, right? We brought in our gods, and they're going to take over your stories. And you know, little scribes, they just go through the text, and they cross out Mardu, or they crossed out Baal, and they replaced them with Mardu. It happened, it happened to the Egyptians, it happened to the Greeks and the Romans, it happened in China and uh, Lower Asia, it happened all over Africa, where these new stories, they're not actually new, they're just repeated stories, and they crossed out one god and stuck the other one in. Now, that's what happens when you invade a land and you let the people keep all their little traditions and you put in the new gods. Well, this is where the pitchforks come in. The same thing is happening in the scriptures. There is a common understanding in the ancient Near East that the sea god and the head god had a battle and they fought it out. They duped it out. And the winner is God. Right? Well, I want to look at this, this Ugaritic text. This is the thing that was discovered in 1928. And here we are. This is ancient Canaan. Baal sits in the midst of his divine mountain, Saphon, in the midst of the mountain of victory. Seven lightning flashes, eight bundles of thunder, a tree of lightning in his right hand. His head is magnificent. His brow is dew-drenched. His feet are eloquent in wrath. The seasons of his reign may Baal indeed appoint, the season of his storm chariot, and the sound of his voice from the clouds, his hurling to the earth of lightning flashes. At his holy voice the earth quaked, at the issue of his lips the mountains were afraid, and the hills of the earth tottered. And now your foe, Baal, now your foe the sea you must smite. Now you must destroy your adversary, take your everlasting kingdom, your eternal dominion. There is a common understanding that the god had to fight against the sea to defeat it. Take a step to the side, and we'll come right back to here. Okay. I'm actually a little bit step over here, so we know where we are when we're talking about this. How many of you watch television? Okay. Right. If you ever watch local commercials? Right. If you get into a car wreck, who are you going to call in to help you? You're going to call in Frank Azar, the strong arm. Right? Okay. You're, you're not going to. But if you were susceptible to television advertisements, that's who you'd call. Right? He's the strong arm. He has this name, the strong arm guy. And if I'm, I don't know, Mike McDivitt, or some other personal injury lawyer, I might make a subversive commercial where I say, don't let that other lawyer strong arm you into taking a bad deal. I would use his own language against him. The Bible does this a lot, right? Pharaoh was known as having a strong arm and an outstretched hand. And in the defeat of, of Egypt, 
right? God says, I'm going to use my strong arm and my outstretched hand, or my my mighty hand and my outstretched arm. And he inverts the language and he uses it, uses it against Pharaoh. We see this happen a lot, right? You, you take the language of your opponent and you twist it up and you say, here's what's really happening. And God proves himself to be the strong one. Here in Deuteronomy, Yahweh came from Sinai. I'm back to the side. At his right hand there was a flashing lightning. There is none like the God of Jeshurun, who, who rides the heavens to your help. These are similar motifs to the other ancient Near East gods. And through the clouds, and through the clouds in his majesty, and he drove out the enemy from before you, and said, Destroy. In the land of grain and new wine, his heavens also drop down dew. I am not saying that this is where a scribe went in and just erased Baal and put in God. Right? And put in Yahweh. I am saying that the idea of God in the ancient Near East was pervasive. And people said, look who the true God is. He does all of the things that you say Baal does. Right? We see this in the fight of Elijah at Mount Carmel. Right? He says, who is the true God? Oh, where is your God? Perhaps he's sleeping. Perhaps he's on vacation in the Bahamas. Right? Maybe perhaps he's going to the bathroom. He's just a guy. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. This is different. This is God is making the sea and the waters submissive to him. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. This is special. The cedars of Lebanon are often also synonymous with the poles that are... Uh, I don't know, idols of Baal, right? An Asherah pole, Baal and Asherah pole. He breaks the cedars of Lebanon. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire, and, and the Lord shakes the wilderness. And in his temple, everything says glory. Yahweh sits enthroned over the flood. He is not fighting against the sea god. He has defeated it. Baal fights the sea and the river to establish his reign. And there's another uh, Baal text that calls the dragon of the sea and the river. It calls him Lotan. That's the name of the sea god. Lotan, and in Hebrew, is Leviathan. It's the same name. Sometimes he's also called Tannin, which is the word for dragon that we see in some other places. And sometimes he's also called Rahab, the serpent. All throughout the, the Old Testament, we see this. Uh, I'm not going to read all of Job 40, uh, 41, right? Job is widely considered the oldest of the Old Testament books, right? I'm looking for confirmation. Okay, good. Right. This is old stuff. And God says, can you call out, can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you defeat this mightiest of beasts? In Genesis 1, when we talk about God making all the sea creatures, the name that is in the Hebrew is Tannin, the dragon. The same as Leviathan. It doesn't mean that God fought against this thing. It says, you know that sea serpent that we're all talking about, the one we're so afraid of, the one that the gods have to destroy? God, Yahweh, the one true God, made that guy on the fourth or fifth or sixth day. He's like a domesticated pet. He's not some enemy that God has to defeat. That's one place that it's subverted. In another place, um, in Isaiah 27... <laughs> talks about how uh, you, God, are the one who defeated Leviathan. In Isaiah 51, you are the one who cut up, cut to pieces Rahab. In Psalm 89, you're the one who pierced the dragon and destroyed Rahab. God is all the time subverting the language of the ancient Near East mythologies and saying, I am the one who destroyed the enemy. I am the one who took the world out of chaos and brought it into order. Actually, I can use that here. Um, I've got some extra notes here. Okay. At the bottom it says Leviathan, the dragon of the sea. So on the left side, this is again from that Ugaritic text, um, which has a really long name that I can't even say. All right. It's German, so somebody can pronounce that, sure. Dry him up, O valiant Baal. Dry him up, O charioteer of the clouds. Charioteer of the clouds. For our captive is Prince Yam, and in the brackets there, C. Yam is the word for C. For our captive is ruler Nahar, river. Those, those are the names, they're the given names 
of those gods or, or uh, beings. What manner of enemy has arisen against Baal, of foe against the charioteer of the clouds? Surely I smote the beloved of El. El was the old king god that Marduk replaced, or um, that Baal replaced. Surely I smote the beloved of El, Yam, the sea. Surely I exterminated Nahar, the river, the mighty god. Surely I lifted up the dragon. I overpowered him. I smote the writhing serpent, the encircler with seven heads. This is the cosmology of the ancient world. They, they believed this. This was what they held to be true about the origin of the universe. And God comes in. The Hebrews come in. And in Habakkuk, did Yahweh rage against the rivers? The word is Nahar, the formal name of the prince of the river, or the ruler. Or was your, was your anger against the rivers? Nahar, again. Or was your wrath against the sea? The prince of the sea, the formal name of the sea. God is the one defeating these enemies. And in their cultural context, these people would have known this mythology and said, Yahweh is the God who defeated these. God, our God is the one who did these mighty deeds. In that day, Yahweh will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, with his fierce and great and mighty sword, even Leviathan the twisted serpent, and he will kill the dragon who lives in the sea. God is laying claim to the world that he created, and he is using the language of the world, the language of these other mythologies, to make his claim. He is subverting their text. And I love this one. Here in Psalm, I don't have the whole thing written down because I ran out of space, but you divided, you divided the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the sea monsters on the waters. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. In this passage, seven times, seven times, the author writes, you, Lord, did this. Not those exactly, but you did this seven times. And crushed the heads of Leviathan, the serpent. And the serpent is known to have seven heads. It's significant. It's not just some random number that they came up with. Right? Leviathan has seven heads in a lot of the tales. And so God does these seven acts to defeat it. It's really, I don't know, I get it. And it may be, maybe because I'm like an English nerd. All right. In the ancient Near East symbolic context, it is clear that God is saying, I am the Lord. I am the one who rules over all of these things. All these things that you believe. That's great. Guess who did that? This guy, not this guy. God is the one declaring himself as the ruler of the world. Okay, we have just enough time to talk about this. In the ancient world also, we had a different type of geography. We didn't know, people didn't know, that the earth was a sphere floating in space. They didn't know that it wasn't like, a, they didn't know that it was moving around the sun, which was in, which was also moving in a galaxy around other things. It was in a galaxy that was also moving around other things. They have no idea, right? The ancient vision of the Earth was this sort of fixed thing, right? The Earth was flat, and that is that. Here's this one. Whatever. We have these words about the ends of the Earth. If we're going to judge the Bible based on its textual like, accuracy in a scientific sense, then we're going to have a lot of problems. I have this gigantic list about how the Bible reflects the view of the world, that we have a three-tiered universe, that there are pillars underneath the foundation of the earth, and there's Sheol down there, and then there's this area, and then there's the sky, and then there's the firmament above the sky, and then the stars are fixed in locations in that big shield, that big uh, roundish thing up there, that there are literal corners of the earth that you can go to. And we see that all the time, that there are literally floodgates in heaven, which has been bandied about in a lot of ways to explain things like the Great Flood and a lot of other stuff, right? And maybe they are literally true, and I'm not necessarily saying that they're not, but I'm definitely saying that the language of the Bible reflects the same viewpoint that the rest of the world has. There's nothing wrong with us seeing the Bible in terms of the culture in which it was written. In fact, it's a really great thing for us to look at it through that lens, for us to better understand who our God is for us to know that the one who wants us to go out into Jerusalem and Judea and to the ends of the earth, the one who has the sun rise up, you know the sun doesn't rise, actually, it's broken. It's come up, right? 
the one who has this, who causes the sun to rise and set and so that's east. And that way, right? He's the one who put the universe in working order. He is the one who has these things happening. There are a lot of things that we we say that aren't directionally measurably accurate, right? Did Jesus descend to the dead? I mean, did he actually like go downward towards the center of the earth and through all the layers of magma and whatever? No, it's poetic language. And that's okay. So when we get to the next few weeks and we're talking about things like the archetypal hero and we're talking about the Christian journey and we're talking about modern myths and how we ought to view these stories and how that ought to impact our lives, we need to make sure that we're in the right frame of mind. That we're looking at God as the author, capital A, and perfecter of our faith. He's the great writer. He's the great creator. He's not just like the strongest of a few gods who duped it out and that you know God's Hebrew people punched the other guys in the face and kicked their teeth in and wrote over their texts. No, God is the one who made everything happen. And our reflection, our reflecting on the world allows us to see him clearly through the text that we have in front of us. Better wrap it up. Um, I'll be outside for questions if you want. But I'm looking forward to the next three weeks and seeing where this takes us and how it helps us understand better who our God is and who we are in light of the stories that he has for us. Thanks. Amen.